Hello and good morning and good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jill Einstein and I'm the Senior Director of Physician Engagement for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Well One uh, for hosting today's session on necrotizing fasciitis. And I'm so um, pleased today to welcome our speakers, Dr. Reza Afrasiabi and Dr. Lisa Gould. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our speakers today, welcome. Thanks for having us, Dr. Einstein. Um, just want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Reza Afrasiabi, one of the trauma acute care surgeons at South Shore Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston. Really grateful for this opportunity to talk about NSTIs um, with the Maven group. Um, if Dr. Gold, uh, I'll go ahead and get started unless you want to I'll do, I'll do just my own quick introduction. Um, I'm Lisa Gould and I work with um, Dr. Afra Siabi. I'm the plastic surgeon that uh, has the opportunity to do the reconstructions after he does the acute work, which is why he's going to present the majority of today's talk. The, so we'll be talking about necrotizing soft tissue infections, previously known as necrotizing fasciitis now really recognized as a spectrum of conditions that fall under uh, NSTI uh, moniker. Um, so the real quick, um, I myself have no financial disclosures to, um, to disclose. Uh, Dr. Gould um, has one disclosure listed below. Again, as Dr. Einstein mentioned, uh, the CME uh, is granted here through the, the Geffen School of Medicine, and uh, that email should be sent to you through Dr. Einstein. So what are NSTIs, or necrotizing soft tissue infections? Really, we hear about them in, in the media more and more, uh, especially during the summertime, um, as uh, beachgoers come across um, small infections in their limbs, that expand into uh, these disfiguring wounds caused by so-called flesh-eating bacteria. And these flesh-eating bacteria uh, conditions, wounds, are actually necrotizing soft tissue infections. Um, you can see how debilitating and how uh, gruesome these infections are. Uh, people end up losing their legs, um, they can uh, occur after simple encounters at the beach. Um, and they often begin with small inciting traumas. Um, and again, yeah, it can result in um, death as well. As we'll talk about, NSTIs are quite um, morbid um, and can be uh, quite fatal. Uh, Necrotizing soft tissue infections were actually first described by Hippocrates back in the 5th century BC. Um, he described them as uh, a, a, mal a malady uh, that settled in the sides uh, with rotting either before or behind. In some cases, the entire thigh was bared or the shin and the entire foot. But the most dangerous of all of such cases were when the pubes and genital organs were attacked an allusion to what we now call Fournier gangrene. Many were attacked by erysipelas all over the body when exciting cause was a trivial accident, really kind of alluding to the fact that NSTIs can begin with small injuries, right? Even sometimes as simple as walking into a door without any penetration of the, the, the flesh itself. And then here, Hippocrates talks about how flesh and sinews and bones all fell away in large quantities, and there were many deaths. Um, fever was sometimes present and sometimes absent. These symptoms were terrifying rather than dangerous. He really did a great job here over 2,500 years ago describing the unpredictable and kind of um, rapid progression of this disease. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, NSTIs are a spectrum of conditions. We used to refer to them as necrotizing fasciitis, um, but now um, we, we talk about uh, necrotizing cellulitis, meaning affecting the skin only, uh, necrotizing fasciitis in which the muscle is spared, as you can see in this right upper 
uh, picture here, right, of a frame, and then necrotizing myonecrosis, where the underlying musculature um, is, is not spared. And you can see here in this, this person's um, forearm with total necrosis of his flexor compartment. Um, it's NSTIs are again a spectrum of rapidly progressing soft tissue infectious processes. It's rare, about only a thousand a year in the United States, um, but this incidence is rapidly increasing. Many believe that this is tied to the increased incidence of obesity in our country, along with diabetes. Some of the pathognomonic findings on physical exam include necrosis of the of subcutaneous tissue, fascia, and and or muscle. There often is widespread undermining of skin. And as I mentioned earlier, necrotizing soft tissue infections fall into one of three tranches, necrotizing cellulitis, skin only, necrotizing fasciitis where the underlying musculature is spared, and myonecrosis where the muscle is uh, becomes necrotic as well. Necrotizing cellulitis is grouped into one of two groups, either clostridial or non-clostridial. Clostridial uh, cellulitis uh, begins typically uh, at a break in the skin barrier. Uh, the causative organism is C. perpringens, clostridium perpringens. Non-clostridial cellulitis, again, occurs in patients without any uh, break in skin barrier, often without any break in skin barrier, and, and typically in diabetics and immunocompromised patients. Um, the causative organisms uh, are mixed, include E. coli, enterobacter, and the, the anaerobes, Peptostreptococcus and Bacteroides fragilis. Here's an example of a non-clostridial cellulitis in a diabetic patient who uh, presented to the emergency room with these hemorrhagic boli. And uh, as you can see, the kind of that's underlying a skin discoloration and tense surrounding skin. No trauma um, uh, preceded the development of uh, the, this necrotizing cellulitis in this patient. Next again, uh, necrotizing fasciitis falls into one of two groups. Um, group one, again, is a break. Uh, it begins at a break in the skin barrier, skin or mucosal barrier. You will often see the dishwater fluid um, when these wounds are open, kind of frothing, bubbling fluid. And the causative organism um, is mixed. Again, Enterobacter, Clostridium, Peptostreptococcus, Prevotella, Bacteroides fragilis, all three notorious anaerobes. And then group two necrotizing fasciitis begins at uh, non-penetrating trauma often. Uh, bruises, muscle strains. Um, this particular type of necrotizing fasciitis has an incredibly high mortality, uh, between 70 and 85 percent, and this is becoming um, increasingly frequent. The causative organism here is group A strep. Here's an example of an abdominal wall necrotizing fasciitis on a uh, mid 30 year old woman who presented to our hospital actually in Chicago when I was in residency there. Um, she had a total abdominal hysterectomy for fibroids that were causing her uh, anemia and pain. She presented back to the hospital two days after discharge with purulent exudate from her fan and steel incision. We took a look at her and took her to the operating room after CT scan showed um, subcutaneous emphysema. And this is what we found. Uh, the dishwater fluid here, this was frothing as we got in, uh, necrosis of the underlying um, fascia. Here's the anterior sheath overlying her rectus abdominis. Um, and it took multiple debridements before we were able to uh, get her to um, get her all the dead tissue, dead tissue out. Um, she, this particular patient was, again, the inciting factor here was the trauma of surgery. And it, there was concern of whether of some sterility issues with the instruments, but we, 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 we weren't entirely sure.
Um, here is post-traumatic necrotizing fasciitis in a patient who suffered a non-penetrating trauma. Uh, this is a, a woman who um, who was struck or who fell on her, her buttock and uh, suffered this big ecumatic lesion that then developed into underlying uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Really horrific considering the very benign mechanism of her injury. She simply fell, landed on her bottom, and the next thing you knew, um, she developed this necrotizing fasciitis. Um, you can see the underlying musculature here was spared. Myonecrosis was that third tranche of necrotizing soft tissue infections that I mentioned earlier. They again fall into two groups, clostridial or non-clostridial. In the clostridial group, it's typically uh, patients who have some form of penetrating trauma, bowel perforation, um, they can even have an biliary disease, retained placenta, um, missed abortions, improperly performed abortions. Um, and th these patients will have recurrent gas gangrene at the site of previous gas gangrene. They're very, very tough to get source control on these patients. You have to be quite aggressive in your debridements. That second group, the non-clostridial group, is really a streptococcal myonecrosis. And about 50% of these begin at the at a site of non-penetrating trauma, like bruising, muscle strains. Very horrific to think that such a disfiguring and potentially fatal um, condition can happen just with non-penetrating trauma. But it is, it is a thing, and its incidence is increasing. Um, many people believe this is tied to, again, the increasing number of people in our population who are immunocompromised, diabetic, obese. The, the mechanism, um, underlying mechanism here is thought to be related to the increased expression of vimentin in skeletal muscle cells after injury. And this vimentin is thought to facilitate the binding of group A strep and really um, provide that nidus for um, infection. Here is an example of uterine myonecrosis following C-section. This, this young lady had a, a C-section um, for a uneventful pregnancy and um, unfortunately developed um, this uterine myonecrosis that then required a total abdominal hysterectomy. Again, the, these penetrating traumas are uh, including surgery are one of the great pre predisposing factors for necrotizing soft tissue infections. One of the most notorious um, and infamous um, forms of necrotizing soft tissue infections is something called Fournier gangrene, which is the necrotizing soft tissue infection of the perineum and scrotum. This was turned by Dr. Jean Alfred Fournier in, in 1883. He was a French dermatologist whose passion and specialty was venereal disease. Um, as you see here, the necrotizing soft tissue infection in involves the growing and even the scrotum here. This gentleman's testes are exposed and even the penile shaft, uh, the skin of the shaft has been has had to be debrided, uh, debrided because of the necrotizing infection on it. And you had extension of the infection onto the lower abdominal wall. Um, over here in this gentleman here, you, you notice that he, the infection not only involved his scrotum, but also um, involved his right testes requiring an orchiectomy. His left testes is still in place. You even see in, uh, the underlying pubis here, the inferior ramus on the right side has been exposed. Um, these are, um, again, diseases that are in incredibly disfiguring, highly fatal um, because of the extent of necrosis. Um, and the, as you see here, you have to be quite aggressive in your debridements to get control, even if it means going down to bone or taking um, a, a, a testy out. So how do these patients present? Um, often, as we, as we mentioned earlier, these patients are diabetic, they're immunocompromised, or they've had some form of recent trauma, whether penetrating or non-penetrating. 
and that penetrating involves, again, surgical procedures. Their vitals can uh, be mixed when they're sick. Obviously, we would expect them to be hypotensive in the worst cases. Physical examination, they'll present with hemorrhagic boli, as we see here in this, this individual. There can be skin necrosis. There can be crepitus when you put your hand on the patient's um, affected extremity or portion of their body, you'll feel that rice crispy feel as the this, this subcutaneous tissue um, has been infiltrated with gas. The skin will be tense and discolored. Laboratory findings um, often have a elevated white count. Their sodium will typically be low and their CRP will typically be elevated. On imaging, you will see you more often than not, we'll see subcutaneous emphysema, and we'll talk about the sensitivity of that particular imaging finding. Here is an example of subcutaneous emphysema on axial imaging on a gentleman with Fournier gangrene here in the perirectal area. You can see these ditzels of air uh, just adjacent to the rectum and below the, below the pelvis. Um, this is on a CT scan. In this individual, the subcutaneous emphysema was so extensive that you could see it on a, on a plain film here on a lateral shot of the right foot. This is very rare. Often you'll have to get a CT scan to be able to see even some specks of gas, to see it on x-rays, quite, quite remarkable. So how do we differentiate necrotizing soft tissue infections from non-necrotizing soft tissue infections? In the year 2000, uh, a group out of UCLA, Harbor and Torrance developed a, a simple algorithm consisting of two variables um, to, to differentiate uh, patients with NSTIs from non-NSTIs. This, this algorithm was developed retrospectively on a group of 350 patients, 359 patients. And basically what they came down to was uh, a white count greater than 15.4 and a sodium less than 135. They were able to develop a sensitivity um, of 90% with a negative predictive value of 99% to differentiate those with NSTIs from those without NSTIs. However, um, this wasn't the most, um, th there was no, there was not much specificity in the study, really a screening uh, study. Um, so um, in 2004, a group of plastic surgeons out of Singapore General Hospital developed a, another scoring um, method methodology or algorithm, if you may. Um, and this consisted of not two variables, but of six variables and a score um, that range from zero to 13. Um, and the variables were CRP, white, cap, white blood cell count, hemoglobin, sodium, creatinine, and glucose. You got uh, different points for each um, of these particular values of these variables. Elevated CRP, you got four points. Elevated white blood cell count, you got two points or one point if it's just moderately elevated. Anemia, you got two points. Sodium, you, you get two points for being um, hyponatremic. And then a, a, additional points if your serum glucose in, is elevated along with your serum creatinine being elevated. So babe, on th this study out of Singapore, this very famous score known as the Lorenic score, the laboratory risk indicator for necrotizing fasciitis, um, showed that if you get if you have a score of greater or equal to eight, you have about a seventy five percent probability of having an NSTI. Um, so this provided a little bit more specificity than that two thousand study out of UCLA, um, and and then in this this other uh, in two thousand nineteen there was a validation study of the Lorenic score. Uh, completed a meta-analysis along with other findings. And what they found was, yes, the Lorenic score is, um, a Lorenic score of greater than eight, greater or equal to eight is specific, but again, not sensitive. 
Um, and they looked at a few other variables in this study. Those variables included physical examination findings, fever, hemorrhagic boli, hypotension, imaging findings, x-ray, CT scan. On physical examination, they found that the most uh, specific were um, uh, hemorrhagic boli and hypotension. However, there weren't many sensitive um, indicators. Uh, the, on CT, um, the most sensitive finding was uh, the presence of fascial edema or fascial enhancement or fascial gas um, with a sensitivity again of 94%. So um, we, we see here that the, the most sensitive way to detect NSTIs is CT scan. And really, um, the, if, you, if you ever have a concern about an NSTI of a patient, of an NSTI in a patient who is stable, I highly advise, and this study highly advises um, getting a CT scan, if at all possible, or if your concern is high enough to to send them straight to the operating room. And, and a Lorenic score, again, not sensitive, but more specific. How do you treat necrotizing soft tissue infections? Simply take them to the operating room and take out the dead tissue. The, the faster you get the dead tissue out, that more likely the patient is to survive. In addition, start broad spectrum antibiotics ASAP. These patients need a big gram positive gun, a big gram negative gun, and then clindamycin. Um, we the clindamycin is a toxin binder for for group A strep, which, as we mentioned earlier, is um, the causative organism for multiple um, forms of NSTIs. Make sure these patients have strict glucose control postoperatively, and then um, refer them to. Uh, Dr. Lisa Gold postoperatively or your local plastic surgeon for reconstruction. So the, the extent of necrosis and NSTIs can be very deceptive. They, um, and you won't know the true extent until surgery has been completed. Here I have a series of lower extremity NSTIs um, where seemingly they were quite limited to maybe a couple boli or maybe some tense skin, or even here, just a patch of skin along the, the dorsum of the right foot. But once surgery, uh, once taken to the operating room, you, you really find out that this infectious process, it can it involves a lot more tissue than you initially expected. And there's quite a bit of tissue undermining uh, that you may have not been aware of um, until you made your incision. We see here how incredibly extensive and disfiguring these infections can be, though seemingly um, involving initially only a small portion of the affected extremities. Got to get them to the operating room as soon as possible because they are also vastly expanding. The reconstruction, um, Dr. Gold will get into this a little bit more later. The reconstruction of these patients with these disfiguring um, uh, wounds can be quite complicated, um, but you can have some amazing results here. Um, this particular patient had a necrotizing soft tissue infection that involved her bilateral growing and her nearly her entire abdominal wall, as you can see here. Later on, with the help of, doctor, uh, of, of surgeons like, like Dr. Gold, they were able to get total coverage of the wound. Um, in this particular case, they used a ALT flap um, and I'm sure several other mechanisms to get coverage. The anatomic distribution of risk factors of NSTIs. 70% of these infections happen in our limbs. The lower extremities more than the upper extremities. Obesity and diabetes are the universal risk factors for NSTI. This is another reason why we're seeing more the incidence of NSTIs going up in, in our country. We have a population that's increasingly obese and increasingly diabetic. So we're seeing more and more NSTIs. You can, um, NSTIs can affect any, any extremity, any portion of the body, 
um, and even affect the neck. The number one risk factor for NSTI of the neck is the use of uh, glucocorticoids. And then um, just going through the Fournier's gangrene, again, um, those account for only 15% of all NSTIs. They often begin as uh, at the an infection in the urinary or genital or um, digestive tracts, meaning they typically begin as abscesses within the perianal space, abscesses within the, the urogenital tract. Um, you can have um, various, typically start small and then rapidly progress. The, I have a couple slides here to talk about the importance of maintaining a, uh, a high index of suspicion of NSTIs in patients who are immunocompromised because they don't present like our immunocompetent patients. This is a study 2013 that we did here at the Brigham um, on 201 patients, um, including a mix of immunocompromised and immunocompetent patients um, who, and these patients had NSTI. What we saw in these group of patients was that um, they, that when you take them to the operating room, that some of the factors that were positively correlated with mortality for, for these patients were absence of bleeding. If you don't have bleeding in the operating room at any point, that means greater necrosis, greater necrosis means the patient's more sick, and as a result, more likely to, to pass. Obviously, the ASA score, the patient's INR, and age were also positively correlated with the, the risk of mortality. Patients with higher, um, who, who got the appropriate antibiotic therapy to begin with, again, that's a big gram positive, big gram negative, and a and clindamycin, something like Benko, Cefepine, and Clinda. The, um, those people had lower rates of mortality. Patients with higher albumin, um, meaning those patients who came in more with a better nutrition status, had decreased mortality and patients who presented with a higher systolic blood pressure had a decreased rate of mortality. The Now to go to the, the immunocompromised patients that I, I mentioned that we should maintain a very high index suspicion if they present with some form of some rapidly progressing um, rash. These patients are less likely to be diagnosed correctly in the first 12 hours. 47% versus 66% in the immunocompetent group. They're less likely to be sent directly to the operating room, about 15 times less likely. And they are less likely to be operated on. They are um, to never be operated on. Um, all because they present with different laboratory findings often. Uh, and hence have lower Lorenic scores, that score we talked at, uh, about that was developed in 2004 out of Singapore. Their white blood cell counts tend to be normal, on average 6.6 .6 for 17 in the immunocompetent patient. Their glucose levels tend to be lower, 124 versus 134 in the immunocompetent patient. And their CRP tends to be lower, 124 versus, versus 159 in the immunocompetent patients. As a result, immunocompromised patients, really, we're talking about patients on, on chemotherapy, glucocorticoids, um, uh, biologic treatment for various um, autoimmune conditions, they're more likely to die during their admission for NSTIs, about a mortality rate about 39% versus 19% for the immunocompetent patient. You see that even being immunocompetent, you still have about a one in five chance of mortality. And then they, these patients, immunocompromised patients are more likely to be discharged to hospice as opposed to home because of the poor outcomes. Lastly, I wanna talk about kind of a controversial topic with necrotizing soft tissue infections of the, the perineum or Fournier gangrene. Um, as we showed earlier, these wounds can be incredibly disfiguring and can involve, um, it can go down to the pelvic bones, can involve even the, the levators. Um, so often 
there's a question of whether these patients need diversions, meaning diverting colostomy or not. Obviously, in those cases where the patient doesn't have or the levators are involved, um, you, you want to divert. But in the, the, the more, the less extreme cohort, there is some controversy. This study, uh, 2015, coming out of India, attempted to tackle this controversial topic. And um, what they showed was they compared a group of patients with Fournier gangrene who got diverting colostomies um, and compared that group to uh, those who only got uh, rectal tubes. What they saw with the bowel management catheters or rectal tubes was that this group had a decreased total duration of a hospital stay, decreased number of trips to the operating room, and decreased total hospital cost, really showing better outcomes in this group. However, in kind of arguing for uh, placement of a rectal tube in these patients rather than diverting, however, their results seem to be confounded by the fact that the colostomy group was sicker, right? The colostomy group had a mortality about 25% versus the non-colostomy group about 6.3%. So although the non-colostomy group did better, that was a result that you would expect given that they appeared to be less sick. So to divert or not really patient specific, there really isn't good data to support um, a decision one way or another. Um, if, if the patient, um, if there's extreme involvement of the perineum involving even the, the levators um, with incontinence, then these are patients you definitely want to divert. Um, and multiple other patient-specific variables need to be considered. Um, it really continues to be a controversial topic. Now I'm going to hand the, the presentation over to Dr. Gould um, to talk about a few of her reconstruction cases. Thank you, Rosa. And as the plastic surgeon who has to take care of the wounds, I um, vote for diversion. <laughs> it's uh, really, really difficult, as you can see in this patient. Um, uh, if you look at the picture on the left, it would be impossible to keep this wound clean without diversion. You also have to remember the patients are very sick. Um, they may not be eating well. They're going to have diarrhea. Um, really, it's helpful in these cases um, to have diversion. But I agree with the interpretation of that paper is that um, the people who got the colostomy were the sickest ones, and uh, that's why they didn't fare so well. So this is um, one of our patients from um, where both Reza and I work at South Shore Hospital. And the demonstration here is that even though this defect on the left looks terrible and you see the drain that's going up into the pelvis, I, as a plastic surgeon, I can look at it and say, there's actually a lot of tissue there um, and I can probably get it closed, but this patient needs several debridements. Um, I think one of the things to really be aware of is when we do the first debridement, it's, um, you can't see everything. And these infections track up the fascia. They just, they're fast moving along the fascial planes. And so we really need to follow that fascial plane. Um, I did take care of a patient when I was um, working in Rhode Island, um, an older patient who had more of a, just an ankle wound, but the actual fascial tracking went all up her thigh. Um, and at that time I was running the hyperbaric unit. And although uh, hyperbaric is not a uh, treatment alone for necrotizing soft tissue infections, um, it can be used as an adjunct, especially uh, to get some of that control where you don't wanna open everything up. Um, so we could do a debridement and then use the hyperbaric as an adjunct, but it's twice a day. So it's really rare to find a hyperbaric unit that's close enough to be able to do that. And you have to coordinate with the surgeons as well and how sick the patient is. So you can see in the middle picture, um, it still looks um, red, but it's uh, I was able to get the majority of the tissue closed, um, skin grafted around the penile shaft, and then left the... Um, uh, abdominal part open. Um, in this patient, he was too sick to be able to do additional flaps. I just used what tissue was there. And that was after um, three operative debridements and some time to let the swelling go down. <clears throat> 
Uh, let's see, you're you're advancing them. <laughs> so next slide. And then you can see how well this healed. Although it looked red and swollen um, in the pictures that you now see, you can see how the, that scrotal tissue goes back to looking almost normal. Uh, the skin graft on the penile shaft is pretty flexible, and then that abdominal wound uh, can go on to heal pretty easily. Um, we left the Foley catheter in, and uh, I don't think this patient actually was diverted. Um, I think we just, he stayed in the hospital, so we were able to take care of the wound. Uh, without diversion. Next slide. Um, this is a different uh, Fournier's case. Again, this is a very compromised patient. So end-stage renal disease, on dialysis, um, a history of an AV fistula, had polysubstance abuse, and also a diabetic. So hitting all of the highlights that we talked about um, and presented with right scrotal pain. Um, and he tried to do his own IND uh, using a safety pin. And so, you know, again, it's a small trauma, but a non-sterile instrument and, um, you know, tracked along the uh, groin and um, uh, wide open exposure of the um, uh, scrotum and the testes. So he went, underwent his index debridement and the wound uh, measured 16 by 10 centimeters and five centimeters wide. But again, when I look at it, I think, well, there's probably enough tissue once the swelling goes down, but the swelling can be a major problem and it can take weeks to go down. Next slide. So this is that same patient and think about it. Um, he came in in March and we're helping with the wound and the edema um, and get into April. Next slide. And in May, the wound bed is clean. The edema is better. Um, and so I undertook secondary closure of the wound. But again, these are really difficult areas and take um, quite a bit of babysitting. Um, he just from sitting um, and from all the inflammation of this insult um, over the weekend, this patient's scrotum swelled up to the size of a basketball, even though he didn't have any further infection. Um, so we had to do some scrotal elevation. And then um, in May, it looked uh, pretty good. The incision was healing. Um, so several months to get this done and uh, lots of going back and forth, we have some in the hospital, but then also in the clinic coming back and forth and having uh, visiting nurses taking care of them as well. Next slide. And so this shows, oops, there we go. And so, nope, one, one more back. So you can, uh, this shows the whole sequence that we started that um, and then he was finally healed um, July 20th, 16 weeks after his initial presentation. All right, next slide. And so this is a smaller case. So we've shown you all the dramatic uh, ones that can get really bad. And always the question is, how can I catch these earlier so that the patient doesn't lose a limb or doesn't have um, such, you know, advancing up onto the abdomen from the, from the groin? Um, and that is keeping that high index of suspicion. Again, uh, diabetics tend to get more of these necrotizing infections when they're polymicrobial. Um, they, they don't go quite as fast um, as the strep. strep. Strep just goes rampant. Um, but in the polymicrobial infections, they go a little bit slower. But in this poorly controlled diabetic, um, he noticed a small red spot that was possibly related to trauma at the end of September and was seen in, uh, then was seen in an urgent care center as it wasn't getting better, um, started on the usual antibiotic for staph and strep, um, but then four days later presented to the hospital. Uh, that middle picture is when he presented to the hospital. Um, didn't have that uh, white count over 15, but his sed rate was high. And in this case, the CT was non-diagnostic, but our surgeons are so used to seeing these. They said, you know, we're going to the operating room. And um, so they took him uh, and then went a second look two days later. And the final wound that he was discharged with was 16 by 7 centimeters. The wound culture was just staph. And so his antibiotics were narrowed. But you can see it didn't, you know, staph, it didn't respond to the Keflex like you would expect it to. Um, and then I'll be skin grafting him on Monday. Um, so the wound is looking pretty good. But I guess this is why I wanted to show this case is because it's a milder one. It's a really great save, um, partly because of the astute patient, um, but also very, very close follow-up. 
So my advice is um, when somebody has an infection that especially you can see how purple and dark it is on that left picture, that's kind of a very characteristic of a necrotizing soft tissue infection. If it doesn't get better with 24 hours of antibiotics, um, that patient needs to be advised that they need close follow-up and um, to get reevaluated and then probably get admitted and uh, get worked up for that. Next slide. I think these are your references here. Yep. All right. So we have time for questions. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for such an informative talk. And I'm, uh, Rez, uh, you can actually stop sharing the slides and then we can see your great faces. And we have some um, questions that are in the webinar chat. Um, I'll start off first with, can you speak to the high rates of misdiagnosis early in the course of illness, given the often mild symptom presentation at the onset and some pointers as to when to suspect? Also, it sounds like any patient presenting with a painful area, back pain or groin or other, really mm -hmm. needs a full skin exam of the painful area to be sure this is not in play. Also, are you seeing an increase in Fournier's with the SGL2? Um, mm -hmm. inhibitors. Great questions. Reza, you see them initially in the emergency room, so maybe you can speak to uh, how do we not miss this diagnosis? <laughs> sure, yeah, the really maintaining a, a high index of suspicion uh, for the, the patient population that, especially the population that's immunocompromised, which is becoming bigger and bigger every year, diabetics, right? obese patients, they're, they're immunocompromised um, compared to non-obese, non-diabetic patients. Um, a very low threshold to put these patients through CT scan. Um, and um, I'm, I'm looking for uh, any, any kind of gas, of course, fascial edema, fascial enhancement. And um, the, um, the other thing is, as Dr. Gould just mentioned, if the antibiotics haven't helped for the for 24, 48 hours plus, I would get surgery on board sooner rather than later. We had actually a recent example of that um, where this late, the young lady from Puerto Rico, um, also immunocompromised, was on, I think, 10 days of antibiotics and the cellulitis of her arm or uh, axilla just was not improving. And mm -hmm. finally, they contacted us we're like straight, we'll go to the, um, we got a CT scan that showed fascial edema operating room and it was an NSTI. In terms of the, um, I, I hope that helps. Really, it's just being super aggressive with getting them to the CT scan, maintaining very high index suspicion and then getting surgery involved as soon as possible. And then knowing that your population, your patient population is increasingly immunocompromised, right? And, um, Reza, if you look back at the photos, um, it seems to me that the purple discoloration may be a clue compared to a regular cellulitis. Is that something that you look for? The so some of the one of the findings that they looked at in that study, one of the variables they looked at physical examination findings was hemorrhagic boli, mm -hmm. skin discoloration. Neither of those were particularly sensitive. They were specific, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that that, that was. If you don't have that, then um, not 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 particularly um, again not not a good rule out test to be looking for that. Um, what was I going to the in terms of these G these weight loss drugs? Mm -hmm. I think it's way too early to make to make any kind of determination. Um, I think the data um, is is still coming in, and hopefully within the next few years we'll know. I think we also know from treating a lot of diet, I'm um, in the wound center and we have five podiatrists that treat a lot of diabetic foot infections and they're, they're the great masqueraders. They don't mind a white count. They don't have a fever. They don't have any pain. Um, so those, uh, especially in the lower extremity, diabetics need to be watched very, very carefully um, because those can go very fast and they're limb threatening, which is life altering and potentially life threatening. Thank you. Another question, in regards to the glucocorticoid use, can you speak to the length of treatment or dose that puts someone at increased risk? Great question. 
I, I wish I had the data to, yeah. to support that. I, I don't, my, uh, I think my, if I were to guess, it would be um, longer duration, higher dose, be directly proportional to your um, your state of uh, immunocompromised state and higher risk of developing these necrotizing infections. But I don't have exact dosage and duration. Yeah. From a wound healing uh, perspective, it is, it's the long-term kind of low dose, you know, the five to 10 milligrams for a really, really long time. Um, it's not the short burst that people get for acute respiratory um, compromise. Thank you. What are your thoughts on alcohol as an independent risk factor? <laughs> alcohol puts you at risk for, um, for trauma penetrating or otherwise. So is indirectly related um, to, to predisposing you to trauma, which then can become a necrotizing infection. I don't have any data to support um, its, um, its direct connection to NSTIs. Yeah. I, ha I haven't seen a direct effect. Um, again, it's the, you know, the IV drug abusers or users who are probably immunocompromised because of that and also um, not very plugged into the medical system. Um, so they think it's minor until it's not. Thank you. Could you address from a primary care perspective when we should suspect and what we should follow? So just putting your, your mm -hmm. um, primary care clinician hat on and mm -hmm. seeing patients just to maybe just summarize or give any little pearls. And I know that there can be multiple situations. I mean, great question. Um, it, I would, I would be really, really aggressive again in our patients who are immunocompromised, uh, particularly in getting them to the CT scan in skin lesions that are rapidly progressing. Again, these immunocompromised people include diabetics, obese, glucocorticoid use, chemotherapy, even radiation um, therapy. I would, I would, if you, if you. If you're unsure, get imaging um, and then get them to surgery as quickly as possible. What you're looking for outside of the imaging um, is a rapidly progressing wound in a patient with uh, crepitus, hemorrhagic boli, skin discoloration, tense skin, um, and who, who, who's looking skin. You can send labs like we mentioned and get a lorenic score on them. Again, you wanna look at the sodium, the glucose, the creatinine, the hemoglobin, the white count, the CRP. If that comes above eight in the primary care setting, or even maybe uh, about six, I would have a low, uh, I would be aggressive about getting them to the emergency room. I'm also thinking about those, um, the non, uh, non breaks in the skin. So the traumatic ones that are strep, um, something that we as physicians were never well trained at is to do a, an oral exam and look at people's um, oral hygiene, because that's where a lot of strep is coming from, and they may be um, seeding from that. Um, I don't know that that's been shown, but that kind of, you know, sent, sent a little trigger to me saying, you know, this is what I see in patients that get strep infections is then I find that their oral hygiene is terrible where they have dental caries um, and it doesn't take much to get a bacteremia that then can seed into a damaged muscle. Great. Um, any other questions? Um, please feel free to you either raise your hand and um, I can unmute you and you can ask verbally or if you wanna type something in that webinar chat. So I'll just give, give a few seconds um, to allow for any final questions. And um, you can also see in the chat just that I put a reminder about the CME survey so that the CME survey will appear in a tab when you close out of this webinar. And we always appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete it. And not only does it give you the CME credit, but helps us to plan sessions and give feedback to the speakers. And um, we're so appreciative of Well One for requesting this topic today. Um, and just a reminder for any of you that are um, on the call from other clinics, 
um, to encourage you to talk with your clinic leadership um, about your clinic being an anchor and choosing a topic for an educational session. And we can get that set up um, for you. And the last is um, for those Maven um, project partner clinics, to reminder that we offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, we have provide clinical mentoring and leadership mentoring so that um, if you are a clinician and want to be able to improve your clinical skills by talking with a primary care volunteer, um, talking about time management, work-life balance, career progression, mm -hmm. uh, we would love to help set you up with one of our Maven Project primary care docs. And um, we also provide leadership mentoring opportunities. So if you are a clinic director, a chief medical officer, if you are someone that wants to become a leader um, in your clinic and want to be able to you know, work with somebody to help you achieve some of your goals, um, we'd love to help you out. So um, you can reach out to Maven Project. Um, you can go and um, submit a form through the community portal. That's where you do the um, education, the um, the, where that's where you submit your medical consults and there's a tab for mentoring. So I just wanted to um, that out uh, to all of you. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. A huge thank you to our speakers, Dr. Lisa Gould, Dr. Reza Afrasabi. And um, it was a wonderful talk, really great, um, really interesting topic, a new topic mm -hmm. for us um, at Maven Project. So again, thank you all so much. And thanks to the providers for taking care of your patients so well. Um, and I hope everybody has a good rest of your week.